All right, at this time, our kids are dismissed to go to Children's Church, and they've got some special things planned for Children's Church this morning. So if you've got elementary age kids, uh, you, can, you can send them on back. All right, kids, be good. Listen to your teachers and learn a lot. And have fun. And have fun. That's one of the things that the kids regularly say is that they, they have fun and they want to come back. And it's so cool, you know. You, I mean, that's a dream come true, right? You want kids to say they had fun and they want to come back learning about Jesus, right? Uh, we hear that a lot uh, from kids who, are, who go for the first time. All right. Well, good morning and welcome. Happy Resurrection Sunday or happy Easter. Uh, he is risen, just as he said, and uh, he is still alive and well. So... Um, I want to welcome you. If you're visiting here for the first time at Impact Church, uh, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here. And I want to turn your attention to the uh, programs that you should have received when you walked in. Hopefully you got one of these uh, programs. And they're having fun already. Wow. <laughs> 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 Woo! <laughs> um, <laughs> but inside of those programs is a blue card that says Welcome Home on the front of it. And we would like to ask you, if you're visiting here, to fill out that card. You should have also been given a pen. And to fill out that card with as much information as you are comfortable giving us. And uh, we just want to be able to follow up with you, right? Like after you leave here today, we want to be able to still communicate with you and text you. And, and I will send you texts about, hey, what can I be praying for you about today? Uh, I might text you an encouraging Bible verse and say, hey, hope this is enc encourages you today, right? We just want to be able to follow up with you in that way even after we leave here today. And so if you would fill that out, uh, and then what you're going to do is you're going to turn the blue card in at the blue tent on your way out. Right outside the doors, there's a blue tent. There's going to be our VIP people standing there. You hand that card to them, and they'll give you a gift. And that gift bag has chocolates and coffee and a Chick-fil-A gift card. And that's really mean of us because Chick-fil-A is not even open on Sunday. So we give you, we give you a gift, and you can't even use it today, but... Uh, no, uh, <laughs> that is ironic, you know, <laughs> but anyway, all those gifts just for, for us saying thank you for being our guest today, all right? So if you're watching online, if you could uh, comment the town or the city that you're watching from, we'd appreciate it so that we know who's with us today. Otherwise, you just show up as a number, literally just a number. We don't know who's watching, just a number, and, uh, and then we can pray for you, all right? So... Uh, I, I, I just want to welcome you. Happy Easter. I hope this is a wonderful, wonderful day for you. I hope being at church today is part of that wonderful day uh, that you have today, uh, that, that this can be a good experience for you. Um, so I have lived all over the place, uh, north and south. I grew up in the north, and then I moved down south, and I moved to Memphis, Tennessee is one place. And if you've never been to Memphis then one of the, you need to know one of the big things in Memphis is Memphis-style barbecue. They love their barbecue there, specifically pulled pork barbecue sandwiches, right? And so when I first went there, I know some of you are looking like, what do those things have to do with Easter, right? Uh, what does barbecue and coffee and chili have to do with Easter? I'm getting there. So uh, I get there in Memphis, and one of the guys, one of my friends, he takes me to one of the famous restaurants, barbecue restaurants in Memphis called Corky's Barbecue. If you're ever in Memphis, please go to Corky's. Go to the original on Poplar Avenue, not one of the knockoffs. Okay. But uh, so he takes me there, and he goes, uh, by the way, one, the way we like to eat barbecue here in, in Memphis is we like to put coleslaw on our sandwich. And I was like, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> He's like, hey, I'm just asking you to consider trying it once. And I said, okay, I'll try it once. I bit into it. I loved it. And now I don't want it any other way. That's a true story. I love bar barbecue sandwiches with coleslaw on it. Uh, I was at my in-law's house one day and they were, they had made some coffee and I saw them pouring something interesting into their coffee. I said, what are you putting into your coffee? And they said, oh, this is heavy whipping cream. You ever tried it? I said, heavy cream and coffee? No, that sounds weird. And they're like, 
we want you to consider trying it just once. And so I did, and guess what? I liked it, and now I don't want it any other way. True story. Uh, that's how I like it best. Uh, so then I was at my in-laws another day, and they had chili. And they said, have you ever had chili southern style? We like to put sour cream in our chili. I said, really? Sour cream? They said, we want you to consider trying it once, right? And so I was like, okay. So I took a glob of this stuff that was in a, a blue Fiesta Wear bowl, and I put it in my chili, and I stirred it up. And they're all watching, and they're waiting, and I take my bite, and they're like, well, what do you think about it? I'm like, dude, this is gross. This is weird. <laughs> I, I said, I put some of that stuff in there, and it's gross. And they're like, that stuff, what is that? And seriously, nobody to this day knows how this bowl got on the table, who put it there, but somebody tasted it and they go, this is mayonnaise. Oh. You put mayonnaise in your chili. <laughs> Let me, I do not recommend mayonnaise in chili. <laughs> I did try the sour cream, I am a fan. And guess what? I don't like it any other way now. There's a common theme here. <laughs> so this morning on Easter Sunday, I am not asking you to consider putting slaw on your sandwich or heavy whipping cream in your coffee or even sour cream in your chili. But what I am considering you asking you to consider is consider Jesus this morning. Consider Jesus. Is there any good reason to believe that Jesus really rose from the dead? That he was dead and he came back to life. And what difference does it make in our lives? Right? What difference does the resurrection make? I want you to consider Jesus, and I want you to have an open mind this morning. If, if I can ask you to have an open mind as I want you to consider Jesus. If you have an open mind, can you just say, considering Jesus today? Considering Jesus today. All right, and if you're watching online, if you want to just type that into the comment, considering Jesus today, type that in there. I, I want you to consider Jesus. I'm not asking you to consider our church or even a denomination, or even the religion of Christianity. Because, you know, Jesus didn't actually come to start a religion. <laughs> he came to give us a relationship with God. I'm not asking you to consider so-called Christians, because let's just be real. Some so-called Christians can be kind of screwy, right? Don't point at them. Don't make them feel bad. Uh, it's Easter. We don't want to make anybody feel bad on Easter, okay? But... But some Christians that call themselves Christians, they're not exactly the best representatives of Jesus, right? So I'm not asking you to consider so-called Christians. I'm not even asking you to consider me, because sadly, as much as I would love to say I am the perfect example of what Jesus looks like, I fall short. Right? So I'm not even asking you to consider me. I'm asking you to consider Jesus. Jesus, who he is, what he did. What his disciples saw him do and reported to us, right? Uh, and, and just go with me on this. Consider Jesus and go with me, and let's just see where it goes, okay? So first of all, I want you to consider the ministry of Jesus. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2. I want you to consider with me the ministry of Jesus. Jesus uh, ran his ministry for three and a half years. And I just, I just really love the way he ran his ministry, the, the way he did things, uh, his, his approach, especially to people, to people. Because uh, in Jesus' day, just like there has been in every age, there's some people who get on kind of a religious high horse, right? And they start thinking they're better than others, and they start excluding certain kinds of people from their group and saying, oh, no, you're not good enough to be in our group. Uh, you got to be perfect and spotless and holy like they were, right? 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 Okay. Like they were perfect. And so one day, Jesus is having a meal with tax collectors and sinners. If you work for the IRS, I'm sorry. People still don't like tax collectors, right? I mean, we just don't like to have to pay taxes. And if you're the one on the other side of that collecting taxes, we don't like you very much in that moment, right? I mean, but Jesus loves you. 
Uh, and we love you because Jesus loves you, but sorry, I, I digress. Um, so he was eating with, I just did my taxes. I'm not very happy right now. Um, anyway, uh, sorry. So Jesus is eating with tax collectors who were viewed as like the scum of the earth. I mean, they were really despised. Like, you do not hang out with tax collectors, right? And other kinds of sinners. He's eating with them. And in verse 16, it says, When the teachers of the law, those were the religious bigwigs, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but who? The sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Right? He says, I I didn't come for the healthy. Right? If you're healthy, you don't need a doctor. I came for the spiritually sick, for those who need help. And, And I love this. Right? I love those whom others despised, Jesus loved and accepted. And that doesn't mean he accepted everything they did, but it just means he accepted them as another human, right? As a person made in the image of God, right? And and so he welcomed them. He he reached out to them. Jesus didn't come for those who have it all together. He came for those who need help, who need his mercy, who need his grace, as we talked about in communion time, right? Um, And and I know what it's like to, to feel out of place uh, you know, when I was in elementary school, uh, I, I wasn't ever really popular. I only ever had like one friend at a time, you know, literally one friend. And then I'd lose that friend. I'd make another. I'd have one friend. I was never very popular. Uh, and I never felt like I quite belonged with the group. I felt kind of out of place. And I remember one day in fourth grade, this lady comes and pulls me out of class into the hallway of school. And she says, Jeremy, do you feel sometimes bored in class, like, like you're not being challenged enough? And I said, I feel like that a lot, actually. She goes, well, we've been looking at your test scores and, and some different things you've done, and we want you to come be a part of this group. It's called Rockford Opportunity for Creative Kids. Rock, for short. I said, okay. They said, it meets every, every Tuesday. You'll spend half the day of your school in this other building with these other creative kids. And I got to say, when I joined that group, I finally felt like, okay, here's where I belong, you know? And it didn't mean that we weren't weird. They, they might, you might have called us nerds or geeks or dweebs or whatever, right? It wasn't that we weren't weird, but at least we were weird together. You know, it didn't change that we were weird, but I found my people like, okay, this is maybe why I found, felt out of place. And I love that Jesus gave people a belonging, a place to belong. Like, hey, you can come be a part of my family, you know, and, and there are some things you need to do. You need to maybe change some of your ways, but, but you can be a part of my family. He gave that opportunity to everybody, right? When everybody else said, we're too good for you, you're not good enough for us, Jesus said, there's a place at my table for you, for the, for the not good enoughs, for the people who don't have it all together. And so if you're sitting there and you think you're perfect, you just keep sitting there shining your halo and <laughs> acting like you got it all together. But just know that Jesus came for the rest of us okay. who are imperfect. Okay? Jesus came for the imperfect. Also, I want you to consider as part of the ministry of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus. Because Jesus did some pretty amazing miracles. Right? He opened the eyes of the blind. He unstopped the ears of the deaf. He caused the mute to speak. He caused the lame to get up and walk. He multiplied two little fish and five loaves of bread, and he fed thousands, tens of thousands of people, right? He uh, he cast demons out of people. He even rose people from the dead. His first miracle, turning water into wine, right? My Southern Baptist friends have a little problem with that one. They're like... I'm pretty sure Jesus turned water into non-alcoholic wine. Yeah, that's it. That's, that's the ticket. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I digress. Let's move on. But Jesus, he did these amazing miracles. <clears throat> and guess what? God is still in the miracle-working, life-changing business. And so I asked some of our impact people if I could share some of their testimonies 
Uh, and uh, I guess Nicole is maybe helping with the kids right now. I don't see her in the room. But she gave me permission to tell you that she, as a teenager, used to practice Satanism and witchcraft. And God delivered her from that and turned her heart to Jesus. And now she loves and serves Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. From worshiping Satan to worshiping Jesus. Come on. Uh, Brenda gave me uh, her testimony. God delivered me from living a life of self-destruction, a life of living in my own self-will, not God's will, uh, not wanting to live anymore and trying to take my own life on 12-9-2009. On 12-10-2009, God spoke to me and said, my child, you have purpose in life. Amen. And I haven't stopped since that day. Today I live for God. My life has changed for the better. I know my purpose is to help others who struggle as I did and to raise my granddaughter, my beautiful granddaughter and grandson uh, to know Jesus, to be the best I can in everyday life. No matter what I go through, I'm going to get through it because of God and my impact family. Yes. Yes. So thank you for Brenda sharing that. Yes. Some of you have heard, yeah, we can clap for God on that. God is good. God is good. Some of you know my testimony of how I got off track living for God. For eight years, I got off on a track of drug use. The last two years of the eight were crystal meth, and I called out to God, and God saved me without any rehab from crystal meth addiction, which is a miracle. That doesn't just happen. People don't just say, oh, I think I'll put crystal meth down today uh, without any rehab. Like, that was God. And he immediately called me into ministry, and I've been serving God ever since. So. God is good. God is still in the miracle working business. God is good. God is good. I want you to consider not only the ministry of Jesus, the miracles. I want you to consider the resurrection because that's what we celebrate today, right? The resurrection of Jesus um, when unbelievable things happen, right? When unbelievable things happen. When I was four or five years old, uh, I was best friends with a guy named Scotty Bruff. I told you I had one good friend throughout my life. At four or five years old, it was Scotty Bruff. And I was hanging out at his house one day, and his grandma was watching us. And Scotty called his grandma, Guh. That's just what he called her. I don't know if he couldn't say grandma, so he just, Guh, that's what it's shortened to. But uh, Guh was watching us, and they told us, hey, guys, don't go into the garage. They had a detached garage from their house. Don't go into the garage. We just remodeled, pulled up a bunch of carpet, and there's some nails sticking up. Don't go in the garage. So you know what we did. <laughs> we went into the garage like dummies, not, not listening to the adults, and sure enough, I stepped right in the middle of my foot on a nail. You know, just right in the middle, just boop. And, uh, and so I started crying. My friend Scotty ran in to find Guh. Guh, Guh, Jeremy stepped on a nail. Come here, come here, come here. And so I remember she came and she stood, came outside the door of their house, stood at the door on the stoop there, and was looking down at me standing at the doorway of the garage on one foot. And, and, she, and Scotty goes, Guh, Guh, he stepped on a nail. And this, she was an elderly lady, and her shaky elderly voice literally stood there and goes, well, what do you want me to do about it? <laughs> what do you want me to do about it? Something, anything. Help me. I'm a poor little kid who just stepped on a nail. I'm bleeding out of my foot. Do something, right? Put a Band-Aid on it. Take, take me to the hospital or at least take me to my parents' house so they could take me to the hospital, right? She just stood there. And I'm like, well, I guess I'm on my own. So I hopped on one foot three blocks back to my house, literally. And finally, my parents took me and, you know, put some hydrogen peroxide on it and took me to the hospital. But it was unbelievable to me as a little kid for a, a, an adult to say, what do you want me to do about it? And just stand there, right? When unbelievable things happen. To some of us, the story of Jesus dying and then coming back to life sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? It's like, what? That doesn't happen, right? Science can't back that up. That can't be explained by science. What are you talking about? But I want to tell you today, the resurrection, there are good reasons to believe Jesus really did raise from the dead. Uh, he rose from the dead. And, you know, this thing about the resurrection really is huge. It's a big deal. It's one of the pivotal things. If you can get past this, if you can believe this part, uh, it'll change everything for you. There was a guy named Josh McDowell. He was not a Christian. And in fact, he went out to disprove Christianity. He was going to prove it wrong. 
okay? And he came back after trying, after researching it and trying to disprove it, he came back and he said, I'm now a believer. And you want to know why? He said, because I could not disprove the resurrection. That one thing. He said, I can't, I can't prove it wrong. I, I believe now. And so he's written all kinds of books. He's a believer. The resurrection is key. This is what God's word declares. God became a human in the form of Jesus. Jesus lived a perfect life. He died on the cross, a horrible death for our sins. We're the ones who deserve that death, but he took it for us. And then, just as Jesus himself predicted, he said, I lay down my life, and three days later I take it back up again. The women go to the tomb, and they find it three days later empty, empty. Right. Just as he said he would. And so why should we believe in the resurrection? If you're taking notes uh, and I really encourage you to take notes, we actually have a section right here uh, on the back of your program. But I want to tell you two main reasons why you you can believe in the resurrection. Okay, the first one is the empty tomb, empty tomb. That's number one. I'm going to read from Matthew 28, which is just a page back in in this Bible. Uh, Matthew 28 And this is kind of a famous story in verse 5, where it says, The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. He predicted it before it even happened. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. Right. So then skip to verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole Him away while we were asleep. Now there's a theory. There's a story if I ever heard one. While we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And watch this. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Right? That was the story that they were going with. The empty tomb. I want to point out one thing that might be obvious to you, but just in case it's not, I want to to make it clear. The fact that they had to come up with a story tells us of how the body left, tells us what? The tomb definitely was empty. If it wasn't empty, all they had to do was show me the body, right? Jerry Maguire, show me the body. Um, But they couldn't do it, right? You're telling me the Roman officials and the authorities and how powerful that government was and all the soldiers they had at their disposal, they couldn't track down the body? They should have been able to with all that soldier and all that power, right? But they couldn't find the body. They could have squashed this whole Jesus story, just show the body. But the fact they had to come up with the story tells us the tomb was definitely empty. And by the way, this really just doesn't make sense. This whole story, come on now. Really? So these 11 uh, disciples of Jesus minus Judas, he was out of the picture at this point, right? These 11 uneducated fishermen came up with a plan, this really brilliant plan, and somehow snuck past like 16 Roman soldiers, and they rolled away a giant stone without waking up those soldiers that were supposedly sleeping. Right? Somehow the giant stone didn't wake them up. Uh, And they stole the body, and they got away with it. But here's where it really doesn't make sense. Ten out of those remaining 11, again, minus Judas, John the Apostle is the only one. The ten others died a martyr's death. Do you know what that means? They were killed for their faith. So they essentially had, and we have all the traditions of how each one died, they essentially had a gun held to their head and said, you stand there and tell me you really believe this Jesus stuff, that Jesus was the Son of God and that he came back from the dead. Are you really holding to that? Because if so, we're going to pull this trigger. We're taking your life. And ten out of eleven said, Pull the trigger then, because we know what we saw. We cannot deny what we saw. And they died for their faith. Because why? Because they knew 100% what they had seen. They saw the empty tomb. And number two, if you're taking notes, the appearances of Jesus. 
They, they saw many times where Jesus appeared to them. <clears throat> so we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Growing up, I did not fully appreciate 1 Corinthians 15 uh, as I do now. Now I love it. This is, this is an amazing passage of scripture right here. In 1 Corinthians 15, which is written by the Apostle Paul, who uh, became an apostle later than the other ones, starting in verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel, that means good news, I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain, for nothing. For what I received, what I was taught, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then what happened next? He was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And then that he appeared. Watch how many times he appeared. He appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than how many? 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. They've died. <clears throat> then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me, the apostle Paul, as to one abnormally born. And then he says, for I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. There's that grace again. And his grace to me was not without effect. <clears throat> so watch this. Okay, he appeared many times, showing himself to be alive again, right? At least a couple times, he would appear inside. Okay, so get this. His disciples were hiding out in a house with the doors locked. Why? Well, they killed our, our leader, Jesus. If they find us, maybe they're going to kill us too. So they're hiding out in a house. All the doors are locked. And Jesus just shows up in the middle of this locked house without opening any locks or doors. Can you imagine how weird, have you ever had someone just show up in your house unexpectedly and you're like, well, where'd they come from? <laughs> Literally, this past week, me and Andrea are sitting at our dining room table and we hear our door, we're not expecting anybody, we hear our door creak open, creak, and we thought, during the middle of the day, we think, well, maybe someone's delivering a package, right? We hear the door go creak and close back, and then we hear these little footsteps, so we get up, we look, and, and he had turned the corner and gone into the living room. Our next door neighbor's little boy, he's like three or four, plops down on the sofa and gets the remote to the TV. Oh, wow. We're like, buddy, you're not watching TV here today. You need to go home. But it was like, what's going on here, right? So Jesus appears in the middle of a locked room. And he says, it is me. I'm alive again, right? He shows the scars. He's like, feel where they stuck me with the spear, where they nailed my hands, you know. Uh, and, and then they, they think, what, what do you think they thought when Jesus appeared? He's a ghost, right? I mean, that's what I would have thought. Like, it, we're looking at a ghost. He, we saw this guy die. He must be a ghost. So what does he do? He says, you got anything to eat? And they were like, we sure do. We got some Memphis barbecue. <laughs> no, he didn't say that. No, he did not say that. I'm sorry. Uh, no, he said, well, we, they said, we got some broiled fish, right? We got some fish. And he goes, okay, here, let me eat. Why is he eating? To show them I'm not a ghost. I'm eating and digesting food. I'm not a ghost. I'm really a body back alive, right? Not just a figment of your imagination, okay? Um, so he ate food. And then I love the one where it says he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Now, what's the point of that? Did that many people just imagine that they saw Jesus like an Elvis sighting or something? No. 500 people didn't hallucinate or just imagine they saw Jesus. They know what they saw. And then he adds, and by the way, most of whom are still living. What is he saying? Go ask them. You can go talk to them. Of course, this is 2,000 years ago. You know, we can't go ask them now. But those people reading this letter could go ask them. They're still alive. They'll tell you how they saw Jesus alive again, right? And so this, this is beautiful. Uh, it turned, these appearances turned two, at least two skeptics 
to becoming main leaders of the church. James, the half-brother of Jesus, uh, there's actually scriptures where say his family thought he was crazy as he was doing his ministry. They're like, he's out of his mind. We, we don't know what he's talking about, this whole son of God thing. He's crazy. James then becomes a believer. What changed? He saw the risen Jesus. That's what changed. The guy who wrote this letter, the Apostle Paul, he used to be called Saul. As he said, he used to persecute the church. He would round up Christians. He would throw them in jail for believing in Jesus. And he was accomplice to murder as he stood and held the coats while other people stoned and threw rocks and killed Christians to death. He used to be an accomplice to murder. And now he's one of the biggest spokesmen of Jesus? What happened? He encountered the risen Lord. That's what happened, and it changed him forever. Right? And I want to tell you this morning, when you encounter the risen Jesus, you will be changed forever as well. I want, to, I want you to consider the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus. And so uh, I got this message on screen in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16, in the New International Reader's Version, which is actually a children's version. But I just I loved how they broke it down. And so I wanted to read uh, this scripture, 2 Corinthians 5, 16. The message of Jesus. So from now on, we don't look at anyone the way the world does. At one time, we looked at Christ that way, but we don't anymore. When anyone lives in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Come on, somebody. All this is from God. He brought us back to himself through Christ's death on the cross. And he has given us the task of bringing others back to him through Christ. God was bringing the world back to himself through Christ. He did not hold people's sins against them. God has trusted us with the message that people may be brought back to him. So we are Christ's official messengers. It is as if God were making his appeal through us. Next screen. One more. There we go. Here is what Christ wants us to beg you to do. Come back to God. I love that part. He wants us to beg you to come back to God. Christ didn't have any sin, but God made him, made him become sin for us so we can be made right with God because of what Christ has done for us. So here's the good news, guys. You can be made into a new person. You can be made right with God. You can be forgiven of your sins. Isn't that good news? That's a good message, right? And it's true. I want you to know you are not crazy for believing in the resurrection. I want you to know there are good reasons for believing Jesus really did come back from the dead. And I want you to know that when you encounter the risen Lord, you will be changed too. Whether you've never given Jesus a chance or if you've been a Christian for a long time, but it's just been a while since you felt a touch from God, right? <clears throat> he can touch you and he can change you. Some of you in this room have been drifting along at the same level of spirituality for a while. And God is ready to take you to the next level, but he's waiting on you. See, God has taken the first step, but we have to take the step back to him. He's already taken all the first steps to say, hey, I want a relationship with you, but you've got to take a step now. You've got to say yes, right? He wants you closer to him, but you've got to take that step. Isn't it time this Easter, what better day? To take that step back to God, if you're coming back to him, or to taking that step to saying, I'm going to get closer to God, right? I want to be even closer to him starting today from here on out, right? Some of you, you know you should get some things out of your life, and you mean to, and you say, oh, I'm going to get that out of my life, that thing I shouldn't have someday, but you haven't done it yet. Right? Some of you are like, I know I should pray to God more than I am, but, and I'm going to someday. I'm going to start praying more someday, but I'm going to read the Bible more someday. I know I should be reading this and getting to know God more, and I'm going to. I'm going to get in that habit someday, but right? I'm going, I know I'm too busy, and I've got uh, my, my busy life is crowding out my time with God, and I'm going to clear some things out someday, but... Today is the day, guys. It's, it's time to stop putting it off and to say yes to Jesus today. Don't put off any longer, right? Whatever that thing is you've been holding back and it's time to do, let's do it, right? Jesus is inviting you. Let's go. 
It's time. Go deeper into Jesus. It's time to ask God to change you. Say, Lord, I don't want to be this way anymore. I want to live for you. Revive me and put a fire in me. Right? I want to know Jesus more than I've ever known him before. And it doesn't matter where you are with the Lord right now. If you genuinely from the heart say to God, I want to know you more. Would you show yourself to me? He will do it. I believe when we genuinely ask God from the heart, say, God, reveal yourself to me. He will. He will teach you. He will show you. Right? But you've got to want it. And so in this moment, God is calling you. God is calling you. Would you pray with me? Father God, in this room, there are all kinds of people from many different walks. Maybe people who have never known Jesus. Maybe people who uh, have known Jesus and took steps to follow him years ago, but they've strayed from him. And it's been many years and they're just now coming back. Uh, Maybe they've been a Christian for a while, but they've been stuck at that same level of spirituality for a while. And you're ready to take them to the next level. God, wherever we are, God, maybe, maybe we just need to go deeper. Maybe we're doing good. We have a good, solid relationship with you, but we, we need to go deeper into you, God. Take us deeper. Take her. Take us. Father, we love you. I pray that you just reach into our lives right now. And if there's anyone who is genuinely praying and calling on you right now and saying, God, reveal yourself to me, that you would bless them and you would show up. Father, make yourself real to us in this room right now. We know you're going to do it, God. We know you're doing it right now. You are moving in this place. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that moves in our hearts. God, convict us of sin if we need convicted of sin. Convict us of our our stagnant relationship with you and help us to take that step. And I love what I read somewhere about the prodigal son. It doesn't matter how many steps you took away from Jesus. The turn back to God is only one step. It's only one step. So, God, help us to take that one step back to you, God. We thank you for your grace that says there's a place at my table for you. There's a place in my family for you. So, God, help them to take that one step. God, uh, you know we're going to open up this stage at the front here, this altar, and say, if you need to come to the altar, and I just pray people would come. And they would just kneel down, and they would spend some time with you and just getting right with you, God. Repenting in their hearts from from whatever sin they may have done or their stagnant relationship, God. Uh, I pray that people would come to the back and see me as I go to the back and just say, hey, what do I need to do to follow this Jesus? Right? Like, do I need to believe in him? Or what does this repenting of my sin thing mean? Tell me about that. What is this baptism thing about? Do I need to be baptized? Like, if they need to find their next step, God, I pray that they would come to me in the back. Would you send people to the front, to the altar, to the back to me as this time, as we open up? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, the invitation is clear. Let's stand. Let's all stand to our feet. And as the band leads us in one last song, do what you need to do, right? If you need to come to the front, if you need to come to the back to see me, 